thanks thanks a lot for the kind introduction i uh, i'm i'm quite honored thanks 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 a lot um with respect to the book i should maybe warn you i mean if, if you look at the publication numbers per, per year then i mean this is always fluctuating but there's a clear dip in 2003 well i'm not sure if i published anything except in the book in 2002 so severe consequences and right now we are working on a new edition and two days ago i just covered that in a specific sub chapter on detergency it says like the con specific contact angle should be as low as possible which is completely wrong it should be as large as possible but obviously everyone else immediately took the, the right message and inverted the message in the sentence so we still discover many errors if you find one send me so that we can improve it um, today i'd like to talk about wetting um, and the motivation is a bit the following it's um, mankind is able to do really amazing things like i mean bringing up people into space in a relatively safe way this is by the way the chinese space station what i still think is amazing is that it is this detection of gravitational waves I mean, people are able to detect changes in distance less than the size of a nucleus, of an atomic nucleus, over distances of a kilometer. Completely amazing. Um, development of, of vaccines against uh, corona within less than a year at different places on Earth. So we are really advanced in many, many technologies. However, if you think about the very simple thing of a drop sliding down a tilted plane, we are not even close of being able to predict how fast such a drop will move. That's, to me, still a bit surprising. As, let's say, as a beginner student, I would expect that this is a boring old problem, which should have been solved hundreds of years ago. It also kind of reminds me of these very old experiments of Galileo Galilei, even before Newton. I mean, he was the one who's always attributed of having, I mean, letting things fall down from this inclined tower in, in Pisa. But in reality, the experiment he did is, is, is shown here. Let me get the cursor. So he, he took small spheres, rolled down an inclined plane, and he measured the, let's say, the, uh, the distances that the spheres covered. Um, and so he had these strings attached to the inclined plane. And always when the, when the sphere passed one of these strings, it made a noise. And Galileo was an accomplished musician, so he had a good feeling for rhythm. And so he adjusted the position of these, oops, where's the cursor? So he adjusted the positions of these, these uh, strings in such a way that it's always equidistant in time. And then he realized that, let's say, the covered distance by a sphere driven by gravity goes quadratic with time. For a drop, we, we are far away from predicting uh, any uh, motion yet. Now, you may say, oh, who cares? I mean, then um, um, maybe wetting is not important. However, wetting is one of those things which we encounter every day and which we encounter in many industrial applications. Um, top left, so birds rely, birds and also mammals rely on the fact that fur or feathers are not wetted, at least most birds are not wetted by the liquid, otherwise they would cool down and they cannot fly. Um, applications, printing and painting, uh, we have bringing out of insecticides, heat transfer, flotation, so there are many things, uh, stabilization of, of emulsions, there are many phenomena, daily phenomena, and industrial applications where wetting is extremely important. Still, if it comes to, let's say, trying to understand it, uh, our, there are quite some limits. Um, I was impressed that the UPAC in 2021 chose superwettability as one of the emerging technologies in chemistry. So let's say understanding and controlling wetting of solid surfaces, and I think this is one thing. Understanding, at least in my, in my interpretation, is that you can make quantitative predictions, but that should typically also lead to, let's say, a possibility to manipulate things, in that sense, controlling. And so understanding and controlling wetting of solid surfaces is one of the big challenges still. Um, in that sense, I'm particularly happy uh, to give this presentation. The Technion, Avi Mamou, is one of the big guys in, in, in in wetting. When I grew up, I mean, he was always the one, maybe one out of two reference figures who understood, in my view, everything about wetting. 15 years ago, I thought, you know, wetting is an old topic. Everyone, I mean, we know everything, which is not the case. 
um, Joshua Zhang, I mean, you also, you kind of continue this tradition now. Here's, here's this, this figure of, of measuring adhesion between a drop and its surface, where you characterize contact angles and the wetting behavior. China is extremely strong here. Um, Lei Jiang, you probably know, here's one example of controlling wetting. So one of those things one would like to control is how easy or difficult it is for a drop to slide off a surface. So this is a, a water drop on a surface which is coated with an organ organogel. Organo you can see that it does not slide if you have the pure organogel. It sticks at least to a high tilt angle. However, if you add some oil like silicon oil, then the drop easily slides off the surface. Chu, uh, Chu is one of the other big figures in, in, in China doing wetting. And this is one example. If you want to control wetting, then having liquid repellency is one of the major things you need to do. And he was able to build surfaces um, which are very liquid repellent, but avoid one of the problems, namely uh, mechanical stability. Zhonghai, I think you contributed here as well. So he made a surface which is really scratch resistant, but maintains its super liquid repellency. Very impressive work. Um, this here is one of the super liquid repellent surfaces, which I primarily show because I like, I, I think it's, it's, it's quite pretty and impressive. Um, contrary to some belief, these liquid repellent surfaces are pretty rough and structured. And I like the image which was taken by Oliver Mackes and from, from Boris Vollmer's group at the time. Um, however, today I'd like to talk more about some fundamentals of wetting. So let's get away from these micro and uh, nanostructured surfaces. And let's go back to the very fundamental situation. So let's consider a liquid drop sitting on a flat, presumably flat, inert, rigid, solid surface. And this is now the, the basic te textbook knowledge, also in our textbook, I must confess. Then experience tells us that, let's say, if you have a specific set of materials, the, the contact angle, which is this angle here, um, is always something somehow the same, at least same order of magnitude. And then already 200 years ago by, by uh, Thomas Young, Young and Laplace, um, they at least in written proposed some equation to describe the situation. And this equation is now pretty much accepted. So if the liquid is a thermodynamic equilibrium with the solid, the contact angle here is determined by the surface tension of the liquid, which is this thing here, easy to measure. It's determined by the difference between the interfacial tensions of the solid and the solid liquid. So this is very nice. This is why everyone uses it. It's a very simple equation. Um, almost no doubt that this is thermodynamically valid. You can easily derive it by, by looking at a force balance. So the force is dragging on the contact line there is the one proportional to the solid surface free energy dragging it outside. There is the one of the solid liquid interface dragging it inside and the horizontal component of the, of the surface tension dragging it inside or outside depending on the contact angle. And the force balance which is valid in equilibrium so there's no movement uh, gives then the Young equation. So I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there is however one problem and this is that the main quantity in this equation, the equilibrium contact angle is not measurable. There is no way of, in a unique way, determine the equilibrium contact angle, at least not to my knowledge and to the knowledge of most experts in, in the field. And that's, that's of course quite troubling. I mean, if you have such a nice equation, everyone knows it. Uh, it's one of the most important equations in, in, in surface science, but you cannot measure the, the most important properties. Likewise, not the solid surface energies are measurable. What you can measure and what is characteristic for a specific material um, is, a, is the advancing and the so-called receding contact angle. All measured contact angles, I mean, which you, which you detect are somewhere in between. So this is the, the bigger one. If for some reason the contact angle exceeds the advancing contact angle, the contact line will move. If it falls below the receding, again, it will move in the opposite direction though. And the whole range in between depends on you know, how you place your drop, or how, you, how you arrange your system. So it depends on, on the history. But the, the two properties characterizing the surface 
are these two, the, the advancing contact angle and the receding contact angle. Unfortunately, the range is pretty large. This was already detected, at least described in, in words by, by uh, Rayleigh uh, and then by Agnes Pockels, um, even in a semi-quantitative way. So they even already realized that I mean this nice thing like like the equilibrium contact angle is, is nothing you can you can really measure. You always have to consider this what they call hysteresis, so the difference between the two contact angles. Um, what is the significance? The significance is um, that these uh, there's a physical significance. So advancing and receding contact angles are not only a nuisance to prevent us from I mean reaching or being able to measure this equilibrium contact angle, but they have a, a very important physical significance. If you calculate or if you yeah, calculate the force required for a drop to move over a surface, then you'll see that this is proportional to the width of the drop. Okay, that makes sense. Surface tension of the liquid, but then the difference in cosine of the two contact angles. So if you, if you imagine that advancing and receding contact angles are equal, the drop would immediately, immediately slide as soon as you tilt the surface. Now, this would be nice for, let's say, car windows or glasses. You know, if you, if you walk out in the rain with glasses, it's always a nuisance because drops are hanging on it. If the contact angles there is, this would be low, drops would immediately slide off. So that would be nice. However, if you think about all those, those applications I mentioned at the beginning, most of these applications depend on the existence of a difference between advancing and receding contact angle. There must be some friction for a drop, some resistance for a drop to slide. And the, the contact angle hysteresis is essential to provide friction to drops. Without contact angle hysteresis, there would be some hydrodynamic friction, but you would not be able to keep a drop on a surface. And I mean, just imagine you want to paint or you want to, to coat a surface. If, if all drops run off, then this would be pretty tri tricky. Or bringing out insecticides. I mean, all these things would be impossible. Flotation would be um, at least very difficult. Um, so in our daily life and in all industrial applications, we very much depend on the existence of contact angles. So that contact angles, there is this. For that reason, it's a bit, a bit surprising that it has gone in the focus of research only in the last um, maybe maybe 10 years. I mean, people always knew about contact angle hysteresis, but it was not so much in the center of, of, of interest. In that context, um, we did, for example, a very, very simple experiment. It's, it's it maybe even <laughs> very simple. So if, if you think about friction of solids, and this is the classical, the traditional experiment. You have a solid block, you have it on a, on a solid surface, and you move, in this case, the, the solid substrate in one direction. You keep the block in position by, by a spring, and you measure the force required to keep the block in position, so the sliding force of the drop. This has been done 300 years ago, Amontor and, and, and these people. And what you measure is force versus time, so you start moving the substrates, the force increases, increases, increases until a certain threshold is reached. Then the block starts to slide. And immediately after it has started to slide, the, oops, the force goes down. And this, let's say, kinetic friction, so that keep the drop sliding, significantly lower than this, this uh, static friction, which initiates sliding. This is how all these electronic braking systems and cars work. So this is all well known. Now, um, uh, Dominic Pilat, Rüdiger Berger, and later Nan Gao uh, wanted to test this for liquid drops. Uh, and initially, I thought this would even be a, a boring experiment. Um, so the, the experiment is you take a drop, place it on a surface, move the surface, keep the drop in place with a micro pipette. What you expect, what everyone would have expected is the force should increase with time because you start moving until you reach advance and receding contact angle and then the drop should start sliding. So this is the experiment. Now let's see if this works here. Yep. Here you can see the micro pipette and you can see it's deflected. The substrate is moving and the drop is shifted so that at the end you have the, uh, you have the two contact angles at both sides and we measure the force. So very simple experiment. In this case, we used an ionic liquid just to avoid evaporation. Uh, whoops. So let's 
Okay, so this is the drop. The result is shown here, and to at least to my surprise, or to our surprise, I can clearly say, if you plot the force versus time, you observe something similar as for solid surfaces. You see first the increase, drops reach a threshold, and then they start sliding, but once they, well, it's the cursor, but once they slide, um, the force to maintain sliding goes down. Meanwhile, we know the reason, it, it, the reason is the change in the contact line or contact area. Um, but I found it uh, intriguing that you have a similar behavior for solid, uh, solid blocks and liquid surfaces, although for a completely different reason. So also for liquid drops, we need to distinguish between the static and kinetic friction in sense. Okay, now um, let's go back. And so in the ideal case, we have Young's equation describing the, the, let's say the shape of a drop. It's valid in global thermodynamic equilibrium. However, we never are able to know if the drop is in global thermodynamic equilibrium or in a metastable state. That's why in the practical situation, this is of limited relevance. Practically in the real world, there's always contact angle hysteresis. And contact angle hysteresis is really caused in many cases by what happens on the nanoscale close to the contact line. So in contrast to, let's say, macroscopically understandable ideal wetting, real wetting needs an understanding on the nanometer, maybe even atomic scale. That makes it very difficult. Of course, as I said, people realized early on um, that, that contact angle hysteresis is present. And we know roughness of surfaces can cause contact angle hysteresis and let's say heterogeneity. And practically all the surfaces we encounter are not perfectly homogeneous. Um, today we discuss more things like deformation, adaptation, charging, and so on as possible additional reasons for contact angle hysteresis. It is clear that those two are not sufficient to explain what we observe, so there need to be additional um, factors. Today I would like to focus on adaptation and charging. So as two sources for contact angles, there is and thus providing uh, friction to drop. So let me, coming from a polymer institute, so let me, let me start discussing a, a liquid drop on top of a polymer surface. Maybe there's a substrate underneath. And adaptive, I call surfaces which spontaneously change in the presence of the liquid or its vapor. And I believe that many surfaces do so, although we believe they are rigid and inert, but most surfaces somehow, at least for water, change their surface properties in the presence of water. But let's remain with the polymer. Let's assume that this, you place the drop and then something happens with the surface. So maybe the water oops, diffuses inside or some, something changes. It changes spontaneously, so the interfacial energy seems to be going down, which leads to a reduction in the contact angle. So if you place the drop, the drop should spread slightly. In fact, when a few years back I gave the presentation, Regina von Klitzing said, ah, oh, this is nice. We observed such a thing more than 10 years back. So this is a polymer layer consisting of polyelectrolytes. And over a time of many 10 minutes, they observed that the contact angle after placing a water drop decreases. So that's precisely what they observed. And now it's clear this is adaptation. However, there's a second thing, which is I think more relevant, it is moving drops. Because if you have a moving drop, then at the front, at the front, you, the, the, let's say the solid is getting in contact with the liquid, while at the back, it's falling dry again. Um, and that should lead to a difference in the receding and the advancing contact angle. So that should automatically lead, adaptation should automatically lead to dynamic contact angle hysteresis. We are not the first to realize that I, I think in wetting business, many things were already said in the old times. So Etza in his treatise on flotation, he already remarked at least in words, he detected uh, contact angle hysteresis, but at that time they didn't really know what causes contact angle hysteresis. So he wrote, thus the surface of the solid from, the, from which the liquid has just receded, so that's this part here. So this part here has a surface tension higher than the surface tension of the original dry surface, which is over here. 
because due to the liquid, the surface has changed and it's still more in, let's say, in the hydrophilic state. And it takes some time to completely dry up and get back, get back to the old state. So here the surface or the interfacial energy is different than in front of the drop. The same holds for this area here, which has already, so the interface has adapted to the presence of the liquid, while right behind the advancing contact line it has not. So why is this important? So let's, let's make the picture bigger. Um, so you have a sliding drop and let's assume the, the surface is somehow adapting. Let's do schematically the, the surface energy. So if we have the surface energy, then here it's the surface energy of the, of the dry initial solid, which had been in contact with air for a long time. So that's an equilibrium. Then, oops, why does the cursor always disappear? Okay, then it gets into contact with the liquid um, and here it's again solid. So this is the ideal situation where the surface is immediately in equilibrium. So there's one value for the dry state and there's one for the interfacial energy for the wet state. Now, if however you, you do have adaptation, the real profile of the interfacial energy may go, may go like this. So here maybe the surface gets into contact with the liquid and initially that's, that's a high energy state, higher than at least than the baseline here. Let's assume it relaxes back because there's an adaptation process, then you go to equilibrium, but the same happens at the rear. So right behind the drop, the surface energy is most likely higher than it's in thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so that's, that's it. I think that's not difficult to understand, but it's a slight complication because now the question, uh, this, this goes with a certain relaxation time, depending on which, which substrate you have. Now, the question is, of course, if you want to apply Young's equation, and I think we locally can apply it because it's, it's, it can be interpreted as a force balance, then the question arises, which, which interfacial tensions do you take? So it's clear on this side, you take this equilibrium value, but, but on that side, which one do you take? Do you take this one up here on average? So and I, I can't give, give an answer, but I think that the question needs to be addressed. I'll, I'll try and answer in a minute. Um, so th the question basically is which parts around the contact line contributes to the contact angle. Let's say somewhere in the middle of the drop, there's probably no influence on the contact angle uh, back here, because I mean the, 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 the interface here doesn't know doesn't know what happens here. But how close do you have to get that the interfaces have an influence on the contact angle? And that's the fundamental under underlying question. And we, following earlier, earlier literature, call this the peripheral thickness. So the question is, what, what, is, what could be this peripheral thickness? Um, I, as I said, I can't give an answer. I can only estimate, and I need you know about range of surface forces. So that could be one possible influence factor. So um, if we know the range of surface forces, which is typically like, like say 10 nanometer, um, then this, this could be a relevant measure. So let's say above 100 nanometer, probably there will be no influence on the contact angle anymore. One should, could also look at the force profile. If we look more closely or on soft surfaces on how the surfaces looks like, then you'll also see this vertical component of the surface tension dragging on, on the solid surface. That also happens on a rigid surface, although we don't notice it, but there's a stress applied to the solid surface balancing the upward component of the surface tension. And here's a, a computer simulation by, by Joel de Conic's group um, showing that the range where the surface applies a stress to the solid is of the order of, let's say, a few nanometers. So as a good guess, I would take 10 nanometer as a good, let's say, order of magnitude for this peripheral thickness, which is relevant for contact angles. So we did then, uh, we, we tried to see what is the influence and we plugged in some plausible parameters for, for the interfacial tensions and for relaxation times and calculated then what should be the advancing contact angle of a moving drop. So here we have the, oops, where's the curve? We have the advancing contact angle, 74 up to 82 is the speed of the drop. And then you can see if there's adaptation going on, at some point, the contact angle goes from the equilibrium value, it goes up. Depending on how fast this adaptation takes place, the, let's say the speed where the contact angle changes also changes. 
So if the relaxation is fast, like one microsecond, then you need a higher speed to see this change. Or vice versa, you can then go slower, then you even notice it at a very slow speed and so on. So there's a clear one-to-one -one relation between, let's say, the, the, the critical velocity and the relaxation time of the adaptation process. The link is always given by this peripheral length. So if we knew the peripheral length, we could even measure uh, the, the relaxation time. Now, this is all uh, a theory. So um, we wanted to at least have some experimentally defined system where we could see such a transition. And so Gunnar Kircher, Rüdiger Berger, and Xiaomi Li did the following experiment, starting with the synthesis of this polymer by, by Gunnar Kircher. It's primarily a polystyrene, so a hydrophobic polymer. Um, but every randomly 10th group is, a, is an acid group. So this carboxylic acid, very hydrophilic. And then um, <clears throat> the experiment is to let water drops run down such a surface. Now, right after preparation or after preparation in the meaning of these films, and we prepared them by spin coating, um, they seem to be pretty hydrophobic. And here is, is one measurement. So here we plot the advancing contact angle versus velocity. And let's start with a pure polystyrene film. Pure polystyrene film, at least our polystyrene and under this condition we use, has a contact angle around 95 degree. That's these blue symbols, that's, that's pretty constant. So there may be adaptation, but if there's adaptation, it's not a very pronounced or very distinct process. However, if we go to the random copolymer polystyrene polyacrylic acid, we see a transition around a velocity of, let's say, 20 microns per second. So the interpretation is, oops, relatively clear. If we, if we move fast, then the surface doesn't have time to adapt. It's obviously the polystyrene groups are at the surface. However, the drop is moving very slowly. <clears throat> and there's time for the carboxylic groups to, let's say, change position and come up to the water drop interface and influence the contact angle. That's at least our interpretation. And if we plug in, we, we have a simple theory to, to explain this, then you can see that this is here the theoretical curve. And we can explain this curve, or we do understand dynamic contact angles, <clears throat> assuming that there's an adaptation process, which we believe, believe is the, let's say, the, the rotation or turning up of the carboxylic groups towards the surface. And this happens at a time scale of, let's say, a millisecond. Meanwhile, we verified this spectroscopically, uh, but at that time it was only, let's say, an assumption, but we can definitely fit, um, fit those results. Nice thing is that adaptation can often explain changes in dynamic contact angle at low velocity. We have theories which explain changes in contact angle at high velocity, so meter per second, but often even at centimeters or millimeters per second, things change, and that's yet difficult to explain, except, for example, with adaptation. Um, then, of course, the question arises, is what could be possible adaptation processes? Because that's a very general terminology. So let's look at possible adaptation on, for different time scales. And as I mentioned, time scales are related to a certain critical velocity of, of wedging. And of course, what comes immediately into mind, and in fact, people in the 50s already uh, anticipated that this should, have, should be a contribution. If you look at an interface, let's say like water molecules are oriented or have a specific orientation at the air-water interface, and they typically have a specific orientation at the solid-liquid interface, depending on the specific solid down here. However, relaxation here is pretty fast. So if in a wetting experiment you create fresh surface or interface, water molecules are very fast to, to, uh, to relax. So probably this process is much too fast to see any effect on, on contact angles. But we could go to larger timescales, for example, the formation of the electric double layer. This always happens in water. That takes longer. That takes, depending on the situation, nanosecond up to microsecond. Um, or if you have surfactant, then the absorption of surfactant at the surface or the absorption of whole micelles, which requires diffusion of micelles. So that's a slower process again. And we enter time regimes of, let's say, around a millisecond. 
which would be observable if this speed is 10 micrometers per second, so even in very slow motion. And for polymers, we have all kinds of, of relaxation processes, which is like the one I presented, let's say the orientation of side groups or the reorientation of side groups. Also, people have made polymer brushes which, with hydrophilic and hydrophobic groups, and if you expose them to a liquid, they will change configuration. PDMS is well known. There are oligomers inside PDMS which diffuse towards the surface. Let me mention also contamination. I mean, all surfaces in air are contaminated. There's always a drop water, organic uh, molecules, unavoidable. As soon as you take them out of the UV chamber, they, they, they will absorb things. And of course, the absorption will change if you place them into a liquid. That again, the desorption adsorption will take time and you can at least formally treat it as an, as an um, adaptation process. So um, let's kind of summarize this adaptation stuff. So we, we do have some quantitative description of dynamic wetting by adaptation. What is nice, it links, let's say, the relaxation time of the adaptation to the change in velocity dependence of contact angles, which is relatively easy to detect. Of course, the question is, as I mentioned, what is the relevant length scale for determining contact angles and which processes on a specific material take place? That will, of course, very much depend on the specific process. Okay, enough of adaptation. Let me now switch to charging. Um, I remember Xu Deng more than 10 years ago discovered that on superhydrophobic surface, I mean, you immediately notice there are strong super uh, charging effects. But typically, if, if we think about uh, tribal charging, then it's between solids. Um, and again, historically, this was extremely relevant because all what we know about electrostatic, Coulomb's law, and all these things were developed in an age where we didn't have batteries. So before 1800, where Alessandro Volta, Volta um, um, made the first batteries. So this was all done by you know, rubbing two pieces of solid and then they charge up and then use this charge to, to, to do electrostatic experiments. That goes back more than 200 years. Um, now, it's not clear yet where charges in tribal charging come from, definitely not quantitatively predictable. It is, however, not so surprising because if you think about two solids um, in contact, then in practically all cases, if it's rigid solids, the, the actual contact is only at small micro asperities. All solids are rough to a certain degree. So the actual contact is only a few percent of the apparent contact area. So even if there is a small load and you shear, you exert very high stresses at these contact points. These, these stresses are definitely high enough to break chemical bonds. So also to release and add electrons or ions. So the energy is present in, in solid tribal charging, no question. However, it's pretty surprising that also water drops do the same job. Surprising because it's a fluid liquid, so it's, it will certainly not exert a huge stress on the surface, no way. However, it's known if you take a hydro, oops, hydrophobic insulating material, you let a water drop run down, it will deposit charges, typically negative charges, and the drop itself will become positively charged. Here is a very nice systematic experiment by Asano's group, where they use Teflon and they measured, measured droplet charge versus sliding length of four water drops. You can clearly see that there is a significant charge. Recently, this has attracted big attention because uh, uh, people want to generate uh, uh, energy from, from such experiments. Changa Wang, you are one of the leading experts here. So you want to use this charge separation to generate uh, energy. Uh, here's one example from Quan's, uh, one, one uh, publication by Quan. Here's one from So et al. Where they use, where they let water drops slide down um, a hydrophobic surface, and they use this charge separation to, to, to generate energy. Here, one by Helsey from in, in Norway, who also did very fundamental studies. Um, so, what is known, and let me get back to the fundamentals of, of charging, and we struggled quite a bit, I must admit. So, these surfaces charge up, even if you start from your neutral state. So non-charged hydrophobic surface, non-charged drop, you will generate, you will separate charges. However, this is very difficult to describe theoretically at least a few years ago, and still it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. 
Why is it so difficult? Because there are many controlling parameters, like, of course, the path links, the tilt angle, as a result, the velocity, uh, the iron content, you may add salt to the, to the water, the surface uh, thickness, um, so how, how thick is your substrate, the surface history, so how many drops have passed, and which is also irritating, the voltages generated can be pretty high. So we talk about few volts, not few hundred, but a few volts, which already influence drop motion, as I'll show in a minute. So that was pretty tricky, but then we, it took us some, I would say two years of postdoc at least to get reliable quantitative experiments. And this was then accomplished by, by Dimitri Golovko and at the end by Amy Stetten, together with uh, Stefan Weber. And, and currently, uh, Ravash Pista is doing these experiments in our lab. The experiment is conceptually simple. You take a drop, place it on a tilted plane, neutralize it again by an electrode. And after some slight length, you measure its charge by a current amplifier. So very conceptually, very uh, simple experiment. This is a typical result. So that is a um, fluorinated surface, or sort of fluorinated silicon oxide. Here's the drop charge, and here's the drop number. So what we do is there is a first drop, a second drop, a third drop and at a constant interval, and we measure the charge of every drop. And then this is a typical result. So the drop is negatively charged, and positive, sorry, the drop is positively charged, starts with around a nanocoulomb, and then goes down and reaches a certain saturation plateau after, let's say, 10 drops or so. This was a nice observation because this, this we could reproduce for many, many drops for many, many surfaces. So at least it's reproducible. Um, now let's do the experiment. Um, so this is now the same plot, only this, the, the X scale is changed. And at the beginning, that's the part I just showed, we had an interval time of one second. So every one second, there's one drop sliding down. If we increase the interval time, the charge in saturate or the steady state charge increases. If we go slower, it, if we wait a minute or so, we almost back to the initial charge. So that clearly indicates there is some kind of neutralization of the surface going on. So the surface seems to be charged, preventing drops following up to gain a net high charge. But if we wait long enough, the surface becomes neutral again and new drops can charge up again. So that with enough time between drops, the surface discharges again so that a new drop can acquire again a high charge. I think that's a pretty straightforward interpretation. So here's a scheme of what we currently believe is going on, although there's not a proof. Um, so if you place a water drop on any solid surface, let's assume it's a hydrophobic one, um, then you will generate an electric, where it occurs an electric double layer. So hydrophobic surfaces become negatively charged. You have the counter ions. Typically, it's assumed that at the rear of the drop, why does this curse always, okay. That at the rear of the drop, these ions dissociate again and are neutralized. However, um, it's now common belief that uh, some of these charges remain on the surface, um, which, I mean, seems to happen, although it's energetically extremely unfavorable. Bringing a, a surface charge, why well, this? Bringing a surface charge uh, to the free surface um, is energetically extremely unfavorable. Many, many kT, many 10 kT. Still, it happens. So that's the idea. We have a certain fraction, although it's a minor fraction, of those surface charges remains on the surface. But again, as I said, there is no proof yet. So if we build a model based on these, let's say, three things. So there is an electric double layer. Some of the subcharges, maybe 10%, stay where they are. And then there is an, um, a neutralization process going on over a few 10 seconds. If we assume those things, we can even fit these complex curves with very few parameters. So at least that seems to be a good approach to start understanding what's going on, insulating low permittivity surfaces. So at least for us, this model now serves as, as the, the next approach to study charging of surfaces by, by liquid drops. Um, there are, of course, many fundamental questions again involved. 
I mean, one of those hallmarks also, by the way, in the book is if you, if you calculate electric double layers, you always assume electron neutrality. So all ions which are at the surface also need to have counter charges in the drop. That does not seem to hold for drop sliding on surfaces. At least there's an error of 10% or so. One, one question is what happens with the deposited charges? So let's assume these are hydroxyl group. What, what, what happens then? Um, we know they are neutralized, but do they become radicals or, I mean, yeah, we, we have no idea what chemically happens at that scale. Um, do they contribute to corrosion or do they lead to some interesting surface chemistry, for example, which may be relevant in evolution, chemical evolution? All unknown questions yet. So here's one, but this is wrong. I mean, I talked to, to real synthetic chemists. They said this is, this is wrong, but they didn't, don't have a good idea either what happens with hydroxyl groups when they are neutralized. Are they radicals or what happens? <clears throat> so that's the neutralization. So let me not, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me get back to this slide on um, real contact angles with hysteresis. And I talked about adaptation and charging and you know all these things. You may now ask, okay, this may all be very interesting, but how relevant is this? I mean, does this happen on some, you know, Teflon surfaces, or is this a general phenomenon? Or does this only happen on, on you know, very rarely used surfaces? Um, so how relevant are these processes? So we did the following, again, very simple experiment. We took water drops and let them slide down an inclined plane, hydrophobic to have a nicely defined contact angle, and because flat drops usually don't move so easily. Um, and then let me just show you one example. This is again a surface coated silicon oxide or surface coated with this fluorinated, this uh, fluorinated alkyl. So pretty hydrophobic. That used to be our standard sample. And then we watch them, I mean, flowing down an inclined plane. It's a very simple thing you could do with your handy camera. Here's one result. Sorry, this is, appears now horizontal, but in reality, the surface was tilted. Just for better comparison, we, I, I, I plot this horizontally. So this is, again, this, whoops, uh, where, why does the cursor always disappear? This perfluoro-octadecyl trichlorosilane on a silicon wafer. This is the first drop which slides down at 50 degree tilt. And you can see every image was taken at 10 millisecond intervals. Okay. Now, second one, um, we have the same surface chemistry, PFOTS, on a silicon oxide layer. However, in this case, the silicon oxide is really on a thick silicon oxide sample with a low dielectric permittivity and definitely no conductivity. And you can see that the velocity of the drop is significantly reduced. Let's get more complicated. If we increase the thickness of the silicon oxide, and we are now millimeters away from the actual contact area, millimeters away, you see that the, that the velocity of the drop is again reduced drastically. Some drops even stick to the surface and don't move anymore. Um, let's go to drop number 50. So same, oh, where's the cursor? So same sample, but now we don't look at the first drop, but at drop number 10 or 15. Again, that drop moves pretty fast. Uh, and here are other examples. So this is polystyrene on a gold film, so I know polystyrene film on sputtered gold. First drop, pretty fast, thiols on gold. And our the fastest movement was on, on Teflon, thin Teflon layer on gold, where drops move pretty fast. Why showing these images? Um, Let's say two years ago, I would have predicted that in all these cases, or let's say three or four years ago, I would have predicted that all these cases drops should move in a relatively similar way, but they don't. Depends not only on the surface chemistry, but it also depends on the substrate underneath and on the drop number. So charging adaptation and all these effects seem to have a big influence on drop velocity. And we talk about more than a factor of two. Okay, um, last question. Um, now, it seems that charging seems to play a role. So could it be that um, these deposited charges, of course, attract the counter charges in the drop? So the drop is positively charged. These are negatively charged. Does the, I mean, the, the pure Coulomb interaction lead to a change of drop movement? 
that's a bit tricky to answer. Um, different theories deviating by orders of magnitude. What you need is being able to measure the force acting on a drop, which is relatively, or which is possible with slowly moving drops, but at least until two years ago, not to my knowledge possible with, with fast moving drops. Um, that there is an influence is now I hope that you can see the movie. Ah, yeah. So this is a Teflon plate, and this is very much a similar experiment which, which Shideng described. Teflon plate, water drop sliding down. Now I can't see the water drops. Ah, now I can see the water drops. So there are water drops falling down and they slide a certain distance and then they tend to stick. We now know this is due to electrostatic charging. Um, and you can see that these drops perform pretty complicated paths. So they initially move fast, and traditionally one would expect them to move faster and faster, um, but they, they, they stop. They also influence each other. Again, which makes sense because if they have the same charge, they repel each other. They also move at the same track, by the way. And at the end, the last drop will hit the second but last drop. They will increase in size and then they roll off. So I, I guess you agree that the, the movement of these drops is pretty complex. Um, uh, let's go ahead here. So the question arises, how can you measure the force acting on a drop which is moving and moving fast, undisturbed? Um, and then the idea <clears throat> we came up with is, is well known in, in when people look at particles or surface forces, they sometimes look at the trace of a particle then they use the equation of motion. And from the equation of motion and the actual movement, they can deduce the force. And we attempted to do the same with sliding drops. So what is the equation of motion that goes back to Newton, so after Galilei? Um, so it says that if you take the mass of your object multiplied with acceleration, so velocity deviated uh, derived by, by time, that's equal to the sum of all forces acting on the object. Very, very principle, very simple. And in our case, of course, on a tilted plate, we have the gravitation, which is this, so mass times uh, acceleration of gravity. We have forces like the viscous force, capillary force acting on the drop, and we may have electrostatic forces. And so, um, as it turned out, we need lots of information. So it was not only doing the experiments, which were again done by, by Jean Billy, together with Rüdiger Berger, but to get the effective inertia of a drop, we needed diffuse interface simulations, which were carried out by Francesco Bozzioni and Holger Marshall's group. We needed some theory of electrostatic forces by uh, Steffen Hart and, and Henning Bonard. And we needed charge measurements by Prava Spista. And finally, Stefan Weber simulated traces of drops with assuming certain electrostatic forces. So that was like, like in high energy physics, many people contributed. And we use different samples, so all everything we could get into hand, which is hydrophobic to have significant contact angles, like this perfluorinated surface, like polystyrene, Teflon, uh, uh, polydimethyl siloxane coated surfaces, and also thiols on board. And we always compared samples which have a high dielectric permittivity, and as a result, low electrostatic forces and low dielectric permittivity, like silicon oxide, or here, gold, even conductive and low permittivity. And then we compare drop motion on these two surfaces in order to identify the contribution of electrostatics. And then we measure the traces and apply the uh, equation of motion. Um, and we always used either a silicon wafer or gold as a reference sample where we assumed electrostatics is negligible. And then this here is one result. So this is what we believe is the electrostatic force versus slide length for water drops, ah, for water drops sliding down uh, silicon, ox silicon oxide coated with this fluorinated, uh, with this fluorinated material. And then you can see, I mean, uh, several things. First is that first, second, third, and so on drop behave differently, which makes sense because the first drop still sees a neutral surface while the second drop already sees the charges deposited by the first drop. 
So the, the second drop already experiences a different electrostatic force and a different charge. And that's why the situation is so complex. And then now we can see that here's the force acting, I think, on the first drop, second drop, and then the whole profile changes shape. So for the fifth drop already, we have an increase in the initial force, which then goes through a minimum, increases again. And for drop number 100 in steady state motion, the force, at least over the first four centimeters, tends to increase, mainly because the drop charge increases. And I should say the, the total force acting on drops is of the order of maybe twice the electrostatic part. So the total force acting on the drop is, is really significant. This is a, um, let's say, a more bizarre example. This is something we measured on, on polystyrene, on polystyrene coated surfaces. And by the actual movement, you can, you can see that this is not a very homogeneous increase of, of the velocity, but there's a periodic part in it. And if we, we then calculate the force acting on the drop, you can see that charges are deposited in a periodic way and the drop experiences a periodic force. Okay. So the, the, the result is that there is a significant, on hydrophobic low permittivity, non-conducting surfaces, there's a significant extra force originating from electrostatics, and that's confirmed by theory. OK, then let me conclude. So um, I, I hope I convinced you that there are still fundamental issues in dynamic wetting which are not understood. And I'm not talking about 1% effects, but by factor of two effects. At least, we are definitely far away from being able to predict drop speed. Um, I, I describe two factors in particular. This is adaptation, which I think happens quite often. This can play a significant role, and we connected the adaptation time with the critical velocity of adaptation. And then I talked about electrostatics and all these open questions about surface neutralization, surface chemistry influence of motion on, on the drop. Okay, and uh, now it's time to thank, I mean, all the people who did the work. This is a large part, what we also had co-workers like Xu Ding. Um, so many people contributed here. Also, the, the, this was financed from many sources like the German Research Society, the European Research Council, definitely, um, Alexander von Humboldt. And I definitely like to thank you for your attention. Thanks for listening. So now I hope. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Booth. Uh, we have currently we have two questions. So if you click the, uh, you can hear me, right? Can yeah. you? Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I can even see you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Professor Booth. Um, so there are three questions so mm -hmm. uh, if you click on the chart ah, let me go yes 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 chat let's see uh chat chat i see okay, ah, okay. let's go from the top kaplan. Uh, there's one. i see the one by wayne kaplan thanks wayne shall i read it first what? pardon shall i read the question yeah, 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 please. Okay, I wonder if you could comment on the deviation from planarity, which is often seen at triple lines for high temperature wetting. Potential pinning at the triple line would then be critical on the measurement of, of kinetics of spreading. Um, yes, to a certain degree. Um, let's say pinning of the triple line, for example, you may have pinning centers. So the, the drop is moving, it's, it's pinned at a specific part, so it's not moving there. And then at some point it overcomes the force of the pinning and the line snaps. This is certainly one important aspect which I think on most surfaces happens. And if you look, or if we watch the contact line on our surfaces, we notice that, for example, on these chlorinated surfaces, the, the movement of the contact line is not very smooth. So the surfaces are not really very homogeneous, very different on the polystyrene where we see a very smooth movement. So I think this pinning plays an important role. We should, however, be able to see this in the contact angle. So then the contact angle should go down and that's, that's one of those things we are now looking at more, more accurately 
just building up a fast microscope to detect this more accurately. It's certainly one of the open questions still. It's clear if, if you make rough and heterogeneous surfaces artificially that this is a dominating factor. The question is on a seemingly homogeneous surface, do you still see this pinning and depinning? That's at least on a length scale below a micron an open question still. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. So uh, we have one uh, next question raised by our postdoc, uh, Dr. Fang. He, and he's asking uh, when a liquid droplet is moving on a heterogeneous solid surface, and the surface roughness can deform the contact line. You already mentioned that if the surface is uh, if the surface is flexible or soft, the surface needs some relaxation time. Mm -hmm. He's asking, is it possible that the contact line of the droplet also need a relaxation time? Good point. Um, yeah. In most cases, however, I would say that the relaxation of the solid part, so if there's a deformation, elastic or plastic will probably take longer, it, at least for liquids like, like, like water or let's say glycerol, sim simple liquids. That may be different for complex liquids. So if you take, for example, um, uh, surfactant solutions, then this may definitely be an effect. So where, let's say, the relaxation in the liquid itself, the water molecules are just fast. But if, let's say, at the rear of a drop, you create fresh, let's say, water or liquid surface, but then surfactants diffuse towards it. That will change the local surface tension and that may change the local contact line. So in these cases, you may have also from the liquid side, a relaxation effect. Yeah, I agree. And this would even happen on an, an, a perfectly inert homogeneous solid surface. But typically I would say it's more the relaxation on the solid side. Thank you very much. I, I, I think I, um, I also can add one comment on this question. So I think if the droplet is viscoelastic or the highly oh. viscous droplet, I think yeah. probably uh, this should be considered. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll have one question. Uh, in the study of speed dependent of the contact angle, is the substrate deformed due to capillarity. Hmm. Yeah, good point. In, in the experiments I showed, the deformation should be at least low. So I expect definitely less than a nanometer, probably less than, a, less than an angstrom, at least elastic deformation. There may, of course, be at the, really at the contact line molecular changes so that molecules reorient and these things. That may happen. If you go, however, to surfaces like, like PDMS, so silicon, and, um, and they are not strongly cross-linked, but soft, then you can even image this with, with a microscope. And this has been done by, by many people, Jakus Nuria, Stefan Karpitschka. There's also by, by Jung Mo Jay, this, this nice X-ray experiment, X-ray microscopy, where he clearly showed that, let's say, if you, if you have a drop and the PDMS comes up at the contact line, we did some optical experiments in back more than 10 years ago. So on soft surfaces, you can see it, and then it has a drastic effect, of course, then drops move extremely far, very slow. So on very soft surfaces, people at the beginning even thought, and I know, uh, I remember a presentation by Jakus Nuya, they took a very soft PDMS surface, placed a water drop to fill with it, and nothing happened. The drop just hang there. And then they, they thought that ah oh, this is contact angle there is this you know what what's what's happening there, but at the end this was only very slow movement. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. So uh, I would like to check if do we have any questions on site? Well, thank you so much, Professor Bot. Uh, I have a question. Pleasure. Yes, uh, I'm Mohammed, a lecturer here in GT, and I have a question about 
uh, uh, the experiments involve the sliding droplets on silicon or fluorated hydrophobic uh, uh, surfaces, you, you show that after, for example, the 50th the 50, the 50 droplet, so the droplet will uh, eventually slide. Now, have you ever measured the contact angle of this sliding, uh, 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 the contact angle of these sliding uh, droplets? Uh, because maybe there is a effect of, um, you know, with time, maybe the water will absorb to the surface and create some very thin film, maybe nano, nanometer thickness. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. then Maybe it's not a charge, it's only pre-witted. Yeah, yeah, we did so. I mean, we always measure automatically all contact angles versus velocity. That's that's a very valid argument. The, the counter argument is if if this happens, it should also happen on the substrate with, uh, with high permittivity or gold underneath. So if, let's say, if you have a 20 nanometer polystyrene film, um, let's say the, the changes at the surface should not be influenced by the gold underneath because that's 20 nanometer away. And this we didn't observe. So if we take a, for example, polystyrene with gold underneath, 20, uh, for 20 nanometer polystyrene gold underneath or PDMS or whatever, um, then the first, second, third drop makes precisely the same movement. So then there is no difference in uh, drop number. The difference in drop number we only observed when the substrate was insulating and low permittivity. That's why I'm, uh, why I believe that, I mean, these effects exist, but they should be the same for all drops. And in our case, at least for those hydrophobic surfaces I showed you, it does not seem to be a dominating case. We noticed it, however, in particular in the first two, three, four months of the experiments, some surfaces were not quite good. And then you precisely notice that if you have drop number 100, 200, and so on, that things change. But after a while, I mean, Xiaomei is now so proficient in making these substrates that they are, they are pretty inert. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you so very much for uh, this interesting uh, lecture. Um, I was wondering about these deposited charges on the surface uh, behind the uh, sliding droplet. Uh, maybe these deposited charges can uh, somehow um, uh, generate an electrostatic uh, attraction maybe with the uh, droplet and maybe they can pull it up while uh, it's trying mm -hmm. to slide down the surface. Yeah. And maybe sh they can also attract uh, the uh, coming droplet uh, after it, and then yeah. uh, lead to some collisions between the droplets. It's very interesting phenomena to see yeah. there. That, that's a very yeah, yeah. That's 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 a very good point, and you you even notice the attraction even. So let's say if if you compare not the the first drop is only retarded by charges, but the the later drops profit from charges ahead of them. So they, they start sliding, they get positive, but they also notice negative charges ahead of them that accelerates them. And you immediately, or you can see this if you do simulations, and this is what Stefan Weber did. I, I was always, you, you, you rem there was this, this force at the end which became stronger and stronger. Um, and I always thought this is very strange, but there you definitely have to take into account charges ahead of the drop, and not only charges behind the drop. Thank you. Okay, um, so one last question outside. Ah, oh, yeah, it would be nice to sit in the lecture hall again and discuss things in person. Yeah. Uh, gute Nacht. Uh, <laughs> gute Nacht. And uh, there's a question I'm wondering is why you're using random copolymer on the surface? Like, what's the effect of the random copolymer will bring to the charges movement of the drops? Mm. Um, so in this case, with this random copolymer, we, we were look, more looking for adaptation. So we didn't measure charge there, though we should be doing this. That, that's a very good point. Um, 
what we hope what happens is, and that actually happened, is that if you if you prepare this random copolymer, that first the hydrophobic groups go to the surface because that's energetically less uh, better, more favorable. So basically, you start with the pure polystyrene surfaces, and all the carboxylic acids are hidden underneath. And then we hope that due to the water, some of these carboxyls get exposed. That's why we added few of them. Um, we didn't yet look, uh, let me think. We didn't do charging experiments yet with the random copolymer, but that's certainly one of the things we should do and combine adaptation and electrostatic charging. Until now, we were happy to understand one of the two. Um, combining the two may be another challenge, I must admit. But we clearly observe it with, um, with surfaces which have amino groups on the surface. Uh, there we clearly observe the mixed process, adaptation and charging. So I guess in this case will be the same. Mm -hmm. I agree. OK. Um, I also find a very interesting <clears throat> question raised by Alex Jenkins. I, I'm pretty sure this is an international scientist. So and he's asking, do you believe that charge built up from the movement of the contact line could be not enough to influence the polymer brush surfaces, even if the surface is homogeneous? Good point. So that we get a, that due to charging, we get a change of the surface. So the charging causes that or change of the surface. Good point. Yeah, could well be. In particular, yeah, could well be. Because if, if you look at the, I guess what we would need to know better is what really happens at the rear of the contact line. Because if you, if you do the electrostatics, there, there is a divergence of electric field. So at the rear of the drop, you, you may get very strong electric fields, which may influence the surface. That could be true. Yes, good point. Okay, um, so, um, so, and so and due, due to the limitation of time, we would like to accept the last question. Um, so probably Professor Boot, you can choose. There are two questions left online. One is from Nei and the other is from Zheng Xu. Uh, for the question of Lei, he is asking, about the difference between the normal adhesion force and the natural adhesion force. I, uh, so probably you would like to comment on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the second question, uh, which is uh, more complicated, and, and so probably you can, uh, you, you can choose how, uh, how to answer those questions. Then let's first the first one. That's, that's the important thing. And we always discuss this in the group because people talk about liquid repellent surfaces. Sometimes they, they mean adhesion in normal direction. Sometimes they mean lateral adhesion. Typically, I would distinguish the two cases because for normal adhesion, you need high contact angle. For lateral adhesion, you need low difference in apparent contact angle. So I think these are two very different things. And we, we notice in these lubricant infused surfaces or the one I presented of, of Lei Jiang, the organogel with a, an oil inside, and then water drop, where even small tilt led to easy sliding. So very low adhesion laterally. But if you want to remove the drop, you have to use a significant force. It's not so easy to remove a water drop from an oil surface. So that's why I think the two should be clearly distinguished. It's, it's two different things. Thank you. Um. So I, I, I think uh, so uh, due to the limitation of the time, so we would like to e express our gratitude to Professor Boot one more time. Uh, and uh, in the future, we really hope to uh, see Professor Boot in person. Uh, thank yeah, you very much. This would be nice. Thank you. Thanks. Thank uh, you. I hope to see many of you in the not too far future. Thanks. Thank you.